So we have Dr. Sejal Dhuria with, with us today. Uh, he is an eminent chess uh, specialist from PGI Chandigarh. And uh, today, so you have a talk on pulmonary embolism. Since the modality is going so far that we have good modalities in CT to detect pulmonary embolism. So many of the patients we detect as subsegmental pulmonary embolism. So the question is whether to treat these patients or not. What is your take on this? There are few points that we need to understand. For example, with the advent of the CT pulmonary angiography and with the ad advent of multi-slice CTs, for example, now we have 4 slice, 16 slice, 64 slice CTs, the res resolution of the CT machine has increased to the extent that we are getting some noise out of the signal. That means some of the emboli that we are detecting may either be false positive, they may not be there but they just show up as small little tiny dots, black dots in the small little vessels that are there in the lungs which is called the subsegmental PT. So there may be a problem of overdiagnosis. And many of these subsegmental pulmonary emboli may not have that much risk of a recurrent VT of a poor short term outcome in terms of say a patient developing hypotension or a patient dying of the disease. So all those poor outcomes may not be associated with these subsegmental pulmonary emboli. So to decide whether to treat these patients or not with anticoagulation, we first have to draw the risk profile of these patients. So how do we do it? So first thing first, first we ensure by taking help of a trained thoracic radiologist that the subsegmental pulmonary embolism that has been reported in a CT report is actually a subsegmental pulmonary embolism and not an artifact. Once we ensure that, then we look at whether the patient has a deep venous thrombosis or not. So if there are deep, vein, uh, deep venous thrombosis in the lower limbs of the patient or if somebody has a central venous catheter and he develops a upper limb deep venous thrombosis which gets detected by doing a compression ultrasound of the upper limb or lower limb veins, then it becomes important that we treat those patients because those patients are supposed to have a, uh, a higher risk of developing recurrent pulmonary embolism. But if you don't have a DVT, then you look at whether the patient, patient's cardiopulmonary status is good or not. Because of the patient's cardiopulmonary status is not good. And even if there is a small risk of a recurrent pulmonary embolism happening, that may tip the balance and the patient may deteriorate. So if the patient has a good cardiopulmonary status, there is no DVT. So as I said, if we have any kind of risk factors that increase the risk profile of that patient, it's always better that we treat because there is no randomized controlled trial data on this particular subject. There are no trials that have compared directly an expected management with just observation and surveillance compared to an active management with anticoagulation. So until that kind of an RCT data becomes available, it is going to be an individualized treatment based on these factors. So, uh, Dr. Duria, for pulmonary embolism, we always say that we keep a high index of suspicion for these patients when we try to detect pulmonary embolism. So, uh, when we detect pulmonary embolism as subsegmental, how do you follow up these patients? Because once it is in mind that patient has pulmonary embolism, it is very difficult to leave that patient. So, how do you follow up these patients, right? So if the patient is minimally symptomatic, say he had some chest pain or some light, slight dyspnea, which we were, we might be attributing to some other comorbidity that he may be having, for example, COPD or any such thing. So either he is slightly symptomatic or asymptomatic, and the risk factors we mentioned are not there, then we don't need, then we just need a intermediate term follow up with a DVT scan. So it has been recommended by various authors that you keep on doing compression ultrasounds in the next two to four weeks at reasonable intervals, five to seven days. They have not mentioned the exact duration, how frequent it should be measured. So in my practice, what I do is I monitor them with a weekly compression ultrasound for the next three to four weeks. And if there is no DVT that I find and no symptoms develop, then those patients can. And there is no, obviously there is no pre-existing factor which predisposes to embolism. For example, an illness like cancer. If that is there, you are going to treat. But if the patient is otherwise fit, he had some acute illness, got a CT done and there was some incidental pulmonary embolus that was picked up and now the patient is walking about, moving, he's fine, there is no other disease. Then you don't need to follow them up after this period of three to four weeks. Is there any role of D-dimers in these patients pre-CTPA or after CTPA in follow-up? Sure. 
So if a patient comes to you in the OPD, he does not have a comorbidity, he does not have any acute illness and the D-dimer is raised, then you have the suspicion or the pre-test probability before doing a CTPA gets increased for these patients. And it also counts when you have subsegmental pulmonary embolism. If you have a raised D-dimer, then you believe that this is an actual finding and it needs some attention. But if the D-dimer is negative and the patient otherwise does not have symptoms which are suggestive, then you can as well not decide to do a CTP itself. So you have to do a pre-test criteria, for example, the well score and other scoring systems which decide the pre-test cl clinical probability of pulmonary embolism. So all those scorings help you in deciding whether to get a CTP or not. And once you have got the CTP, they add to the information uh, the information that you obtain from the CTP. Thank you Dr. Sejal Dhuria for uh, interactive session and being a part of PAX India 2018. Thank you very much.